Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jeff Gingrich. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at this great university. I want to welcome everyone. Pleased to welcome you to the Sandra and Maury Myers Distinguished Visiting Fellowship in the Humanities and Civic Engagement. This fellowship was founded to advance the university's efforts to bring renowned scholars, artists, and thinkers to Scranton to share their work and enrich cultural and civic activity at the university and in Scranton. We started this fellowship in 2019, and it's been a little slow getting started because of the pandemic, but we've already had some really good speakers so far. We launched the fellowship program in 2019 with an incredible lecture by Wayne Winburn, who's the executive director of the Institute of Jazz Studies at Rutgers. And we had a variety of panels and um, a, a different uh, festival of ideas, we called it. And it was really a wonderful way to start the, this fellowship. Then of course, COVID hit. We've been trying very hard to continue this series and we've been we were able to do that very for a moment over Zoom uh, last fall. We were fortunate to have Lonnie Bunch on Zoom. Mr. Bunch is the 14th secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and the founding director of the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And for those of you who were able to see that, it was just a really great interview uh, that uh, Mr. Bunch back to campus sometime. But we're finally at the point where we can get to where we wanted to be in the first place, which would be have a couple days of a sustained speaker with us here in person. And so we're so glad to be at this moment and to have your, our speaker who we'll get, you'll get introduced to in just a little bit. Before we start though, I wanna make sure you understand the foundation of this fellowship and the people that we're honoring, Sandra and Maury Myers. Many of you might know Sandra and Maury, and they're sitting right here in case you don't. Uh, we're so honored to be honoring them. It's worth elucidating briefly here on the incredible people they are. And, and it's also fun to embarrass Maury and Sandra too. So uh, we'll do that a little bit. Sandra is a re renowned national leader in the arts and humanities who serves as a senior fellow for international civic and cultural projects and is director of our Schemmel Forum at the University of Scranton. Before joining the university, university, Sandra served as a senior associate at the University of Maryland's De Democracy Collaborative and as the Rappaport Dem Democracy Fellow at the Walt Whitman Center at Rutgers University. Sandra served as special assistant to the chairman for partnerships at the National Endowment for the Humanities and was cultural advisor to the Pennsylvania governor, Robert P. Casey. She was appointed by President Obama to the Commission on Presidential Scholars in 2011 and was appointed by President Carter to the U.S. Commission on Fine Arts in 1980. So uh, Sandra has been around and has been called upon by some pretty big names. Sandra has been a member and vice chair of the university's board of trustees and received an honorary degree from the university in 1987. Her partner in life, Maury Myers, is one of the most distinguished and respected members of the Pennsylvania State Bar. He's a practitioner in state and federal court. Meyer, uh, Maury is a founding partner of Myers, Breyer, and Kelly. Previously, he served as general counsel to the Pennsylvania Governor Robert P.E. Casey and general counsel for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. During the civil rights movement, Maury was among the few lawyers who traveled to the South as a volunteer to provide legal services for those engaged in civil disobedience in both Florida and Mississippi. Both Sandra and Maury have just some great, every time I'm with Sandra and Maury, we, I learn a little bit more about them from some really great stories. A little more on Maury. He was a consultant to the President's Commission on Campus Unrest, Chief Counsel to the Pennsylvania's Milk Control Commission. I imagine that was a, quite a controversial commission to be on. And Chairman of the Hearing Committee of the Disciplinary Board of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, among many other activities. And that's just a, just a glimpse into the life of Maury and Sandra. And that's really why we're honoring them with this fellowship. And so we're so proud to have them as, as members of the community and as leaders of the community. And please join me in thanking Maury and Sandra for their life's work.
And now on to our main event. And I'd like to ask Dr. Michelle Maldonado, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, to come forward and introduce our speaker, Michelle. I'm just doing the intro, but thanks. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Provost Gingrich. Following Dr. Montas's talk, um, Dr. Matt Meyer, Professor of Philosophy and Faculty Director of the Slattery Center for the Ignatian Humanities, will be moderating the Q&A. Roosevelt Montas' story begins in 1973 in Cambita Garavitas in the Dominican Republic. He would only spend the first 12 years of his life in his home country, making the journey to New York City where he would spend his adolescent years being educated in public schools in Corona, Queens. He would later become the first in his family to attend college, receiving his bachelor's and PhD from Columbia University. Like so many Latinos and Latinas from the Caribbean, what is in fact a short two to three hour flight is a journey to a different world, culturally, linguistically, and ideologically. In Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a New Generation, Dr. Montas intertwines autobiography with his argument that liberal education is for all and not just for the social elite. Dr. Montas also reminds us the importance of, a liberal art, of the liberal arts for democracy and civic engagement. Dr. Montas offers us, in his words, and here I quote, a meditation on and an introduction to the experience of liberal education, end quote. A journey that began with his discovery of a copy of Plato's dialogue in a garbage pile near his home has led him to become senior lecturer in American Studies and English at Columbia University, director of the Center for American Studies Freedom and Citizenship Program, and former director of Columbia's Center for the Core Curriculum. In a recent interview in the NEH magazine, Humanities, he states, and here I quote, Liberal education is an approach to learning that foregrounds our existential condition. It takes seriously the idea that rational inquiry into the fundamental questions of life is a worthwhile endeavor for each of us, end quote. There is much in Dr. Montas's work that resonates with Catholic and Jesuit liberal arts education. Jesuit universities speak of the care of the person, the service of faith and the promotion of justice and contemplation and action. Roosevelt Montas does not use these terms, but maybe he will after he spends some time with us in the next book. Yet his passionate case for liberal education embodies the core of who we are and who we strive to become. On behalf of the University of Scranton, I want to welcome you to our community. On a more personal note, as a Latina who traces her roots to a neighboring island, I want to thank you for sharing your story of a 12-year-old boy who arrived in this country from a rural mountain town in La Republica Dominicana without speaking a word of English, only to be enrolled in an Ivy League university six years later. As a university that traces its roots to educating the children of those who worked in the coal mines of this region, we are grateful for your advocacy for first generation, historically underrepresented and low income students, and for reminding us as gatekeepers that a liberal arts education is not just for the economically privileged. Gracias, Roosevelt, y bienvenido. Thank you for that extraordinarily generous introduction, Michelle. Um, I, I was touched, wondered what this wonderful person is. Uh, no, thank you. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here. 
on campus. This is one of my first in-person events. Um, and from already from what I've learned about kind of the soul of this place, um, there could have been no better match. Um, so I, I really feel honored to be here and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I want to thank Michelle Maldonado again and, and Jeff Gingrich for the care with which they have organized my visit and the flexibility in scheduling that made it possible for me to be here this evening. And I also want to thank Sandra and Maury Myers for their vision and their generosity. It is their commitment to community that has made it possible also for me to be here. And of course, I want to thank all of you for taking time to come hear a talk under a title as abstract and vague as liberal education for human freedom. I hope that by the end of our time together, you feel that your time has been well spent. Perhaps a good way to approach this topic is to elaborate on the key terms on the title, namely human, liberal education, and freedom. But before jumping into all of that, let me say something by way of preliminary. And here I am addressing the students who are here for this lecture. In preparing it, I have had you especially in mind. So let me say this to you students specifically. Tonight, I'm going to talk about liberal education. And while I will explain in more detail what I mean by that, for now, let me just tell you that liberal education is the part of your education that isn't directly aimed at preparing you for a career. The part of your education that is not relevant to any particular profession or occupation. Liberal education is that portion of your education that is due to you from us by virtue of your humanity. The part of your education that sees you not as a professional in the making, but simply as a whole human being, and that tries to equip you to face that condition in all of its mystery and complexity. So what I want to say to you directly before going into the substance of my talk is this. If you pursue your liberal education honestly and openly with intellectual integrity, it will transform your life and open your horizons in ways that you can't imagine and that will make you a deeper, more authentic and more awake human being. You may think that I am overpromising, but I am not. But do note that the promise is conditional. The condition is that you pursue your liberal education with intellectual integrity. Simply sitting through the courses and passing them, even passing them with A's, won't do it. As with all of your education, you can go through it successfully and still have wasted your time doing it. Intellectual integrity means honesty, openness, and the courage to ask the most fundamental questions. It means never ignoring, suppressing, or dismissing your deepest yearnings for truth. Only the truth satisfies, and intellectual integrity is the requirement for its attainment. Speaking of this, Ralph Waldo Emerson noted that whilst the doors of the temple stand open night and day before every man, and the oracles of this truth never cease, it is guarded by one stern condition. This, namely, it is an intuition. It cannot be had secondhand. If you pursue your liberal education in this way, I guarantee that it will be profoundly transformative and that it will mar mark you for the rest of your life. So let me begin with the word human. Etymologically, hmm. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Allow me to just walk over here and make sure that my presentation is loaded correctly. We, of course, tried this earlier today. Oh. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. So let me begin with this word, human. Etymologically, in its origin, the word humans come from the Latin humanus, and it is related to the word for ground or earth. This same connection between human and earth exists in other ancient languages and in many myths that present humans as originally formed from clay. You will remember that in Genesis, God forms man out of the dust of the ground. Humans are earthly beings, beings of the earth, which immediately suggests a distinction between us and other non-earthly beings, the gods. From very early on in the history of humanity, we have defined ourselves not only in relation to the rest of the animal world, but also in relation to a higher and more perfect being than us, something divine. Speaking, speaking strictly, strictly from a scientific point of view, hmm. uh, yeah, the, let's see, well, hold on a second, let's see. Okay, no, I got it, I got it, yeah. Speaking strictly from a scientific point of view, the first erect apes begin to appear in the fossil record around six million years ago. The upright posture represented a major evolutionary reorientation. With it came the relocation of the eyes from the sides of the head to the front of the head, where you can look in front of you and see far distances, perhaps far into the savannas of Africa, or while wading through shallow waters near a shore. Walking upright, came before hominids developed the big brains that characterized them, and by freeing up their hands to use tool, it probably opens the evolutionary path for those big brains to develop. The upright posture also required narrower hips, which constricted the birth canal, a problem if other evolutionary forces at the same time are selecting for bigger brains and bigger heads. This produced what is sometimes called the obstetrics dile obst obstetrical dilemma and helps explain why childbirth in human is so painful and so dangerous, and why, and why human babies are born essentially premature before being fully developed. I have a four month old baby who has in the last few weeks experienced a kind of awakening. Like now she has finally mastered the basics of living outside the womb and is ready for the explosion of cognitive and physical growth that's coming ahead. It was a long time after walking upright that modern humans, the Homo sapiens, would appear in Africa. This happened, as best we know, about 200,000 years ago. Other members of the genus Homo emerged much earlier. Here is Homo habilis, who emerged about 2.1 million years ago. This is, of course, a, not a live picture. This is a reconstruction based on uh, skeletal remains. Um, Homo erectus over here came along around 1.8 million years ago and survived all the way down to 70,000 years ago, which means that it overlapped with our species for well over 100,000 years. And the most famous of the early homos is the celebrated Homo neanderthalus which roamed Europe from, from 500,000 years ago to, to just 40,000 years ago. This is the very recognizable Neanderthal, the star of the ABC sitcom, Caveman. This is from a few, a few years ago. But these are, the Neanderthal is only the most famous of the, of, of, of the um, members of the genus Homans. They were, um, at least two dozen members, there are probably more, but we have evidence of at least two dozen members of the genus Homo that share the world with Homo sapiens. The fact that they are now all extinct and only us, Homo sapiens, have survived is worth noting. We must wonder why that is, and I'll come back to that. But first, I want to draw your attention to the fact that 200,000 years ago, when anatomically modern humans emerged is not that long ago. Think of the time from the birth of Jesus to now. Imagine 100 of those intervals and you've got 
the entire history of humankind. From Africa, humans spread to Asia around 60,000 years ago, and from there to Australia about 50,000 years ago, then to Europe around 40,000 years ago, and to America perhaps as recently as only 15,000 years ago. But it all started in Africa, which of course brings home the obvious point that we are all African immigrants. Since the United States where we live is largely the product of European civilization, let me highlight the, migra the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa and into Europe, again, just 40,000 years ago. When Homo sapiens, which evolve in Africa, arrive in Europe, they find it teeming with other humanoid species, including the larger, more muscular Neanderthals, who were better adapted to the cold climate of the Ice Age then enveloped in Europe. Neanderthals had been in Europe for over 100,000 years already before Homo sapiens showed up. But when Homo sapiens came, Neanderthals became extinct within about 10,000 years. With the arrival of modern humans to Europe 40,000 years ago and the abrupt disappearance of Neanderthal skeletons, we begin to find modern looking tools, needles, fishing hooks, jewelry, and cave paintings, such as this extraordinary image of the bull from the Lubang Jerigi Saleh cave in Indonesia, Borne in Indonesian Borneo. This is the original red bull right here. Or this slide, an extraordinary ca carving from the Stadel cave in Germany, lion man, or perhaps lioness woman, dated from about 32,000 years ago. I find this quite extraordinary because no one has ever seen this creature. No one had ever seen this creature. This is a quantum leap in imagination and creativity that speaks of an inner world of imagination and limitless possibility. If you can imagine this, if you can represent this, it indicates that your mind has broken free from the data that it perceives. This really is, is you know, you, and you can imagine what is, what is the role of this? Is this a god? Is this an object of reverence? Is this a toy? Is this, um, we don't know, of course, its actual function, but we do know that it represents something extraordinary happening inside of human beings, in human consciousness. Around the same time, we have the appearance of jewelry and representation, that we have a, this appearance of jewelry and representational art um, this, this, this jewelry, decorative arts, points to a rich inner life, a spiritual and aesthetic dimension that characterizes these people, a dimension of living that is related and relied on to symbolic representation and is not determined by utilitarian use. This didn't have any use. This was not for, you know, beating a a bull or something, or, or, or hunting or fighting. This doesn't have a utilitarian use. And here, in this activity of non-utilitarian expression of the imagination, exploration, and elaboration of the human experience, you find the first instances of the liberal arts. But back to this question, why did Neanderthals disappear in Europe so abruptly after the arrival of Homo sapiens? I find compelling the theory that points to a violent struggle that proved catastrophic for Neanderthals right around the time that human, the human beings arrived. Modern humans, it seems, eliminated Neanderthals who had been in Europe for tens of thousands of years within a few thousand years of arriving. We know that there was some interbreeding, but not a lot, and that's significant. I guess there are always some members of the population who are sexually adventurous. Um, I'm told that people of European descent, for example, have on, on average some 2% Neanderthal DNA. Um, other, uh, another, the, the other biggest group of hominids whose DNA remains in small portion in our gene pool today are Denisovans. Um, two, two important things. One is that there is interbreeding, but second, the interbreeding is minimal. Um, that is, human beings, uh, homo sapiens, did not 
successfully or massively interbreed with these other species. Uh, they smelled bad or something, but, but um, they, ke they kept to themselves uh, reproductively in large part. I bring this up to make the point that despite our reason, despite the artistic sensibility that produces something like this, despite the spiritual development and the civilized ways, we emerged like every other species on the planet in a brutal struggle for survival. This is one of Darwin's hard lessons. There is a severe and unforgiving mechanism behind our evolutionary success. He called it the struggle for existence, a mechanism which destroys the vast majority of life that sees the light of day with casual brutality. As Darwin notes coolly in the third chapter of The Origin of Species, I estimate that the winter of 1854-1855 destroyed four-fifths of all the birds in my grounds. So we are conditioned in our instincts, our inclinations, our attractions, our paranoias, our delusions by that hard evolutionary history. Our instinct for aggression, our greed, our suspicion of strangers runs deep. Christian theology recognizes this condition in the doctrine of original sin, sin, a crook in the human heart that cannot be corrected by our own effort, no matter how earnest. But if we accept that our ability to vanquish our competitors ensured our triumph as a species, we must also recognize that the key to that competitive advantage was our ability to cooperate with one another. We developed the capacity to put aside narrow self-interest and pursue collective, collective aims rather than individual aims. That capacity was, if I may put it this way, an evolutionary revolution. It seemed to have happened around 50,000 years ago when humans attained behavioral modernity. This period transformed this is the period that transformed Homo sapiens from one of the many hominids running around into the top species on the planet. Sometimes this is called the cognitive revolution. We don't know what happened. For 150,000 years, Homo sapiens roamed around like every other animal and its hominid cousins. And then, perhaps due to a genetic mutation related to language, but we don't know, around 50,000 years ago, there's an explosion in symbolic culture, abstract thinking, art, religion, ornamentation, trade. Anatomically, we are the same. Skeletons from before and after the cognitive revolution look the same. They're indistinguishable physiologically. But something fundamental shifted. And this shift allowed us to vanquish, to vanquish our evolutionary competitors and take over the planet. We are obviously, obviously continuing to experience the consequences of the absolute domination of the planet by one species. This has, has never happened before in the history of life on Earth, that one species becomes as dominant as we have. And we are, of course, proceeding with great effectiveness to eliminate um, much of the many of the other life forms on Earth and are well on our way to making the planet hardly habitable for any form of life including ourselves. Today, some of us are pacifists. We want, to, we want to end war and all forms of violence. This is a stance we can adopt today, but it was the opposite of pacifism. It was aggression, guile, ruthlessness that brought us as a species to this privileged place where we can set aside violence and aggression, rise above what Mahatma Gandhi called the law of the jungle, and into a place that transcends the old evolutionary logic. This is Gandhi's vision. He accepts Darwin's evolutionary account, but still affirms a spiritualized view of the uniqueness of humans. To quote him, the activities of eating, drinking, sleeping, feeling afraid, etc., are common to man and beast. But man has the power to distinguish between good and evil and can also know the self. One animal subdues another simply by its physical might. Its world is ruled by that law, but not so the human world. The law which is most in harmony with human nature is that of winning others by the power of love, 
by soul force. I believe, therefore, that if we take up, if we wake up to the consciousness of our true nature, we would, that very moment, renounce the law of the jungle. Whether Gandhi is merely indulging in romantic fantasies and ignoring the harsh truths of science and history, or whether he is, in fact, pointing to some evolutionary transformation brought about by the emergence of consciousness and the possibility of self-knowledge, I leave it to you to ponder as I get back to the story of Homo sapiens. Let me go through a few more significant dates. 5,000 years ago, we have the emergence of the first kingdoms, writing and money. And you might, might realize that to have a large kingdom, a large system of cooperation and order organization, you are going to need to have writing. So those two come, come in together. And you're also going to have to, to have some kind of money that is sometimes so, some kind of representation for a value, currency. 3,000 years ago, we have the Trojan War. And of course, the Trojan War gave us the beginning of Western literature because the first major and complete work in Western literature is uh, an account of events in the Trojan War. 2,700 years ago, we have the probable composition and assembly of the Iliad, that work that takes place in the Trojan War. 2,500 years ago, we have the emergence of Athenian democracy. And that place, by the way, Athenian democracy is where liberal education begins. And I'm going to come back to that moment of beginning of liberal education. 500 years ago, we have the scientific revolution. You might think of the scientific revolution when we, when we figured out how to hack nature, or at least we figure out that nature is hackable. The scientific revolution, of course, unleashes a whole paradigm of disciplined, methodical study on how to master and manipulate nature for our own benefit. 200 years ago, you have the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution replaces muscle power with mechanical power. Up until the, 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 the Industrial Revolution, every single structure that was ever built was, was, was done. The, the force was, came from muscle power, ultimately. After the written Industrial Revolution, we have mechanical power, notably steam power, but other forms of power come in. Just 50 years ago, we had the beginning of the digital revolution. Um, you know, you can, you can try to figure out when, when that date is. One, one, one candidate is the development of the transistor um, or of, of, the, of the microchip uh, later on. But somewhere in the last 50 years, we entered this, this thing that dominates our lives today and that makes much of this evening possible on which we're relying this evening, the digital revolution. And then just 10 years ago, I, I dare to pass it, I, I propose, that just 10 years ago, we've entered a, another revolution, the biotechnology revolution. And I think the signal, the signal date there, again, you can place a biotechnology revolution at various points. You can place it in the, in the 50s with the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick in a British laboratory. You can place it maybe in the year 2000 when we, uh, completed the human genome, or you can place it, in, place it in 2012, which is where I'm placing it, but with this date of 10 years ago. And what happens in 2012 is the discover of the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing mechanism, gene editing technology, a technology that allows us now to edit genes in a process very similar to, to the kind of the cutting and pasting that we do in Word documents, uh, in, in electronic um, documents we can do that very, very effectively now with genes. Um, so, so much from my first term, humans. And I guess just let me say that the biotechnology revolution, where we are now, is in some ways the most fundamental of all the revolutions. And, and one thing you can see that is that the revolutions get faster and faster, you know, writing, before writing, there's the agricultural revolution uh, where, where humans move from being nomadic hunter-gatherers to being cultivators, 
where they can stay in one place and grow things. And when you can do that, stay in one place and grow things, A, you can have much larger populations. You can only have small groups work as, as uh, cooperate as, as, as hunters and gatherers, as nomadic. Once you settle in, you can have much larger groups. You can also begin to accumulate stuff. You can build houses and you can fill them with stuff. You can accumulate wealth. You also are going to need forms of governance and um, structures of cooperation when you're settled down. Between the agricultural revolution and the, uh, and the revolutions brought about by writing, a huge amount of time happens. Um, between that and the development of democracy, between that and the scientific revolution, between the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution, the interval gets shorter and shorter. This last revolution that I'm pointing to of biotechnology holds out the possibility of permanently altering the fundamental building blocks of life and specifically of human life. This is not something that's happened ever before in the history of life on earth, that one species has figured out how to crack and alter the fundamental code of life. Um, I don't want to digress too, too, too much about this, but you might know that the, that, that, that the British uh, health agency, the, the National Health Service in the UK, some years ago approved a procedure that permits an, a, a, a human being that has DNA from three parents rather than two. Uh, and the reason is because there is a, a disorder carried by by um, uh, by some by some eggs, by some fertilized eggs, by some by some um, zygotes, where the egg doesn't have mitochondria, which are kind of the powerhouse of the cell. You might remember from basic biology, and they've approved that procedure whereby a donor egg with functioning mitochondria. Mitochondria have DNA. So the DNA that belongs to, in this case, the mother, uh, the, 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 the woman that produced the egg, that egg can then be uh, fertilized or, or a nucleus of a fertilized, another fertilized egg with the DNA of both parents can be put in there and create this viable egg, this vi viable zygote that now has DNA from three different human beings in it. And uh, this, this, this is now something that's happening. It's a way of addressing this, this uh, genetic disorder uh, that is quite, quite dangerous and terrible for, for kids. But anyway, that is just the beginning because now in the human genome line, we have this new, this new thing. Uh, that is only the beginning and we are at the cusp, at the moment where we have to make ethical decisions about how to treat this very powerful technology that fundamentally changes our evolution. From here on, human evolution is going to be something else, something that is not governed by the laws of evolutionary biology and competition that Darwin described in, in, in the origin of species and, that, and, and which has been the foundation for a biological understanding of the world. But anyway, so much for my, for my first key, key term. Let me turn to my second term, liberal education. This by the way, is the subject of, of my book that just came out and, and, and uh, about which Michelle said such nice things, Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a New Generation. In that book, I explore liberal education by looking at some texts that are especially conducive to the project of liberal education. But I also argue for liberal education by reflecting on how liberal education shaped my own life. So it's kind of a memoir. Let me say something about the term liberal. Um, the term liberal has a political currency in our culture, right? You can be a liberal, you can be a conservative. And the liberal, the, the liberal ideology is associated with the Democratic Party and conservative ideology is associated with the Republican Party. The term liberal in liberal education does not refer to that ideological split that we have in our society today. Liberal here means something quite different. Liberal here refers to freedom, right? right? Liberty, it's a synonym for freedom. It's the same root, root that where, from where you get the word liberty from, liberty from. And let me point out that this question of freedom, this question of, of liberty, it's something in which both conservatives and 
liberals agree on. If you ask a conservative to explain their political philosophy, it probably won't be long before they talk about freedom. They talk about uh, a conservative will, will explain their ideological position by talking about the value of freedom and the imperative to protect and preserve that freedom from incursions, whether it be from the government or from other sources. You ask a liberal to talk about the political ideology, and it probably won't be long before they also talk about freedom, before they talk about how you, how the exercise of freedom requires certain forms of collective association, requires certain, certain kinds of stability, predictability, op equality of opportunity, et cetera. Only under certain social conditions can you meaningfully be free, and therefore it explains their, their political orientation. So the term liberal, this commitment to human freedom, is something that liberals and conservatives both have in common. And it is that fundamental of freedom, of human freedom that goes into the term liberal education. I said that liberal education begins in fifth century Athens. Fifth century Athens is a slave society. We talk about Athens as the first democracy or at least the first full-fledged full democracy. And I just wanna point out that when we say that, that Athens is a democracy, we are, using a kind of metonymy, a kind of rhetorical figure of speech that takes the part for the whole. It's like, um, you know, when you say uh, that, when you, when you call, um, I don't know, if you call it, uh, if you refer to a tree by calling it leaves, um, you're taking the part and, 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 and ref using it to describe the whole. So, so Athenian society has one part that's democratic, the citizens, and it's a real full democracy. Every citizen holds political office. Every citizen votes directly on laws. It's not even a representative democracy. If you're an Athenian citizen, you, you directly vote on laws. You directly vote on political strategy. You sit on juries. You serve in the, serve in the army. You hold political office by turns. People took turns in holding political office. A true democracy, but only for the citizens. There's a huge slave population that is even bigger in number than the citizens. They're not part of the democracy. So when we talk about, when we think of Athens as a democracy, it's like when you look at an iceberg and you see the part that comes above the surface of the water and you say, that's the iceberg. But of course, underneath the water, invisible, there's a huge part of the iceberg that's also part of the iceberg. You can't have the top without having the bottom. The same happens with, with Athenian democracy. Athenian democracy, so, so I just wanna qualify what I mean, and re remind ourselves what we mean by Athenian democracy. And let me just point out that there is a historic relationship between democracy and slavery. Um, democracies, including our own, have tended to come with slavery. We might wonder today, we obviously don't have chattel slavery that was uh, banned by the 13th Amendment of the, of the U.S. Constitution, so we don't have that form of slavery. But one wonders whether our own democratic life, our own democratic politics, our own democratic society exists, subsists, depends on a category of, of, of persons who are subjugated, exploited, coerced in a way that uh, in a way that recalls that recall slavery. That is, we should wonder whether, to what extent our contemporary democracy continues to depend or to sustain some forms of slavery. But anyway, liberal education begins in this context, in the context of a city-state with a direct democracy. The question arose, what kind of education would be appropriate for the citizen? What kind of education would prepare the citizen to fulfill the roles that this citizen had to fulfill. What are those roles? Making political decisions, passing laws, weighing in on military strategy, serving in political office, serving in the army, sitting on juries. How do you prepare somebody to exercise the kind of judgment that allows them to participate in this, in this, in, in self-governance? Well, you, that person is going to need to know something about history. That person is going to need some, to know something about geography, something about the weather something about philosophy, something about ethics, something about the economy for sure. In fact, there is no area of human understanding and human learning that lies outside of what this individual who's being prepared for a life of citizenship and for a life of self-governance needs to know. And that is the origin of liberal education. It is that education 
that is appropriate for the free, self-governing individual. Liberal education is contrasted, therefore, with slave education. Right? It's liberal education as opposed to a servile education. Today, we contrast liberal education with technical education, applied education, professional education, vocational education. Look at a quote from that time, from the beginning of liberal education in Athens. Aristotle, of course, is, is writing um, from Athens, although he was an immigrant to Athens, he was from, from Macedonia. Um, he writes in the politics, the best city-state will not confer citizenship on vulgar craftsmen, for it is impossible to engage in virtuous pursuits while living the life of a vulgar craftsman or hired laborer. Now, of course, this expresses the sentiments that we reject. We'd say, you know, a, a laborer should participate in democracy. We reject the idea of excluding laborers from democracy. But in what way is Aristotle right here? Aristotle does have a grain, of truth, a grain of truth here, which points to the fact that in order for you to meaningfully participate in the project of self-governance, in the democratic process, you have to have some bandwidth that's not always dedicated to just making a living. If all you have energy and time for is to just make ends meet, you cannot have the cultivation, the information, the deliberation, the education that allows you to participate meaningfully in politics. In other words, politics has to be in some way a leisure activity. That is, politics has to be an activity that you pursue apart from the thing that you need to do to just make a living. It's got a, it requires a certain kind of bandwidth and latitude of action, deliberation, that exceeds the mere demands of making ends meet. Here's another quote from Aristotle. It is evident then that there is a certain kind of education that children must be given not because it is useful or necessary, but because it is noble and suitable for a free person. This is, this is, this is the, 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 the grain, the, the, the nub of liberal education. A kind of education that is pursued not because it is useful or necessary, but simply because it is noble, simply because it is suitable for a free person. One other quote on liberal education from Kant, Immanuel Kant, the science of the laws of nature is called physics, whereas the science of the laws of freedom is called ethics. This quote really articulates in a very, in a really elegant way, an insight that I think is quite intuitive to us about the nature of, of ethics. Ethics being a liberal education. That is ethics being about the laws of freedom. Let me illustrate that. Imagine that you are walking down the street and you see somebody who's evidently in a hurry, walking, walking fast, get somewhere. You can tell by the way they're walking that they're in a hurry. This person encounters someone who's having trouble crossing the street. You know, maybe somebody who's disabled, somebody who's loaded with packages, somebody who's, 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 who's having trouble getting across the street. This person stops. So let's imagine it's somebody, let's imagine that it's a disabled person. This person stops, helps that disabled person cross the street, and then proceeds on the way. You, you see that, that activity, and you say there's moral value, there's moral worth in that activity. It was, an, it was an ethical, selfless thing to do for this person to stop, even though they were in a hurry, and, and come back and help this person who needed help cross the street. Now imagine that you learned that this person who did that actually had committed some crime in the past whose punishment it was that whenever they saw a person struggling to cross the street, they had to stop no matter what and help that person. All of a sudden, the same action of this person stopping and going back and helping the person kind of loses its moral shine. It loses its ethical quality. Why? Because that action was compulsory. That action was not freely chosen. In other words, ethical action is only ethical when it expresses our freedom. Ethical action, moral action, must always be, can only be an expression of our freedom. This is why liberal education is, in the most profound sense, always and inevitably, a moral education as well. 
education in the loss of freedom, education in the exercise of liberty is fundamentally, inescapably a moral education. So in the first place, liberal education is to teach you how to be free, to teach you self-governance. Self-governance not only in the collective or political sense, but also in the individual sense. One of the shocks of college life, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, both as students and as, and as, and as faculty or administrators, one of the shocks of college life is the challenge of self-governance. Most people who fail at college do not fail for intellectual reasons that the material they are asked to learn is just beyond their grasp. Most people who fail at college fail because of failures in self-governance. A liberal education, in a liberal education, one is exposed to how others have approached the challenge of self-governance, of freedom, and use that to organize our own way forward in life. So you can see right away that liberal education is going to be different than other kinds of education in the university. In most disciplines, the subject to be learned is at the center of the endeavor. And the facts and skill to be learned are codified, transmitted, and then tested for in straightforward ways. Not so in the liberal arts. In this field of study, the student, the individual, I say living, growing entity, is at the center. The subject matter here is secondary. The inner transformations and developments that the subject matter promotes is the liberal education that we're after. What students get from a liberal, edu a liberal education should be ultimately a clearer vision of themselves, a set of mental habits and dispositions that will enrich their lives regardless of their career path. When you learn something liberally, the learning that you do is not just added on top of your previous stock of knowledge. When you learn something liberally, the experience rearranges everything else that you know. You don't end up just with more knowledge on top of the old stock. When you learn something liberally, you end up with a different configuration of knowledge. Liberal knowledge, in other words, alters the internal proportions of your soul. The very act of learning in this way is an exercise in freedom. It cannot be compelled. It cannot be coerced. You can only be liberally educated through an affirmation of your own freedom of your own irreducible individuality, of your moral autonomy, of your dignity. Liberal education has to take the student as an end in itself, never as a vehicle to advance any other goal. So liberal education is not interested in you becoming a doctor or an engineer or a literary criti critic, but in your becoming a fully realized and integrated human being. And what is it today to be a fully integrated human being? Let's think about that for a second. We live in a historically unprecedented moment, not just in human history, but in planetary history. Never before in the history of the planet have there been seven and a half billion large mammals walking around, consuming, producing, tinkering. And we are not just any kind of large mammal. We are rational. We are conscious. We have figured out how to manipulate our environment in astonishing ways. Even though, as Darwin noted, we are just one among many actual and possible life forms, there is no disputing that we have broken from the evolutionary pack. Whatever happened about 50,000 years ago turned us from a sneaking and skittish ape into the dominant species on the planet, with a dominance so complete as to be unique in the whole history of life on Earth. But back to my point about liberal education emerging in a slave society as the type of education that was appropriate for those who were free. Today, in a society where chattel slavery no longer exists, the essence of liberal education continues to be the development of individuals as free agents rather than as laborers, workers, or even academics. In this way, Liberal education represents a special mission within the university. A good part of the university, of a university education must be specialized, must be about creating economically productive individuals who can earn a living 
and to perform specialized functions in society. But that's not the soul of the university. That is not its unique and sacred function in society. The university must be precisely a place where instrumental knowledge can be put aside to create the space for liberal knowledge. The university, in addition to its other functions, must also be an oasis from the economic and technological forces that shape and often distort our social institutions. Which brings me to the last term, freedom. Not yet. skips a couple of quotes which I'll just read to you. Freedom. I find the story of Frederick Douglass to be one of the most inspiring and illustrative examples of the meaning of a liberal education. Here's a passage from Douglass's autobiography, Life of the Life, Narrative of the Life of an American Slave. Now let me frame it. Frederick Douglass is born in a plantation in Maryland, a slave. Um, one of, of many, it's a large plantation with a lot of slaves. Um, when he is about eight years old, um, he's called into the house and told that he is going to be shipped away from the plantation to the city of Baltimore, a big, bustling port city with a lot of ships coming in from the north, from the free north, a large free black population where the brother of Frederick Douglass's legal owner, he was named Frederick Bailey back then, the legal owner of Frederick Bailey's brother lived in Baltimore, and he had a little boy about Frederick's age. And they said, we're going to send Frederick to live in that household and be a kind of companion to the little boy and a house servant, house slave. So Douglas is, say, is, is shipped there. It's the first time he is in the city. It's the first time he sees tall mass ships. It's the first time that he is treated by the wife of his new master, who had never owned slave before, is treated as a human being, as, an, as, an, as a human child, as a child. And it, it's, it's a revelation for him. But this incident that I'm about to read happens very soon as, after his arrival. One thing about this passage that I'm gonna read, it has the N word in it. A word that was a slur even back then when, when Douglas wrote it. And in fact, it's in the mouth of the slave owner. Um, in this passage, but I'm not going to pronounce the word. I'm going to replace it with the word slave simply because that word today has assumed such a uh, poisonous charge. And, and so many people find it just offensive uh, on its face. In deference to that, I'm not going to pronounce the word, even though it is the word that Douglas uses here, the, the, the N word. So very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Old, she very kindly commenced, me, commenced to teach me the ABC. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point in my progress, Mr. Ald found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Ald to instruct me further, telling her among other things that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. To use his own words, he said, if you give a slave an inch, he will take an L. We have a saying like that. If you give somebody an inch, they take a mile. An L means like the corner of a house. Um, so if you give a slave an inch, he will take a mile. A slave should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning will spoil the best slave in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that slave, speaking of myself, how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good, but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented and unhappy. Then Douglas steps back and says, these words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering and called into existence a new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation, explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been to me a most perplexing difficulty, to wit, the white man's power to enslave the black man. 
From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. I love this. So Douglas always wondered, you know, as a kid, why he enslaved the black people? How, why is that? It's not that they're stronger, I know them. It's not that they're smarter, I know them. What is it? What is it that gives the power to the white man to enslave the black man? And here he heard it. Learning would forever unfit him to be a slave. He says, I understood from that moment the pathway from slavery to freedom. But today you might say there is no more slavery. That thing was outlawed. Well, that's not quite true. There is no more in the U.S. chattel slavery where you are literally owned by someone else 24-7 and for the rest of your life. But there are other forms of slavery all around us, forms of subjugation, coercion, and domination. And in this environment, liberal education still, as it was for Douglas, continues to be the pathway from those forms of slavery, coercion, subjugation to freedom. One of the most pervasive forms of slavery around us today is what some people have called wage slavery. That is when you, when you sell your labor for a period of time and are during that time completely subject to someone else's will. This form of slavery was recognized in antiquity. One of those old writers that like to ask fundamental questions, Cicero, in his famous book on duties, where he says that, quote, whoever gives his labor for money sells himself and puts himself in the rank of slaves. It's almost taken for granted today that it's okay, that it's some kind of life to sell yourself to servitude and dehumanization from Monday to Friday in order to buy the privilege of living on weekends. But it's not so. This is not the worthiest life for a human being. There is little human dignity in that, and on the contrary, a degrading brutalization of human freedom. So it's not right that college education should just be about preparing you to sell some portion of your humanity for wages. Yes, of course, education should give you skills and competencies that should be help, helpful to you in finding a job, but there is also a higher calling for education, and the liberal arts are the curricular expression of that calling. Education should also be about how to be free, about how to live the life of a free individual, not just the life of a hired laborer. As W.E.B. Du Bois would put it, the true college will ever have one goal, not to earn meat, but to know the end and aim of the life which meat nourishes. Aristotle in the politics makes a relevant point. A complete community comes, for the sake, comes together for the sake of living, but it remains in existence for the sake of living well. Aristotle's insight here is quite crucial. While survival and sustenance are at bottom the reasons why we live together, any well-organized society will overcome the threat of extinction quite quickly. Once the necessaries of survival are assured, the questions of living shift fundamentally, and we begin to concern ourselves not just with survival, but with existence. How do we live well? What kind of knowledge best guides life? What do we do when most of our physical and mental energy doesn't just go to surviving. Here's what Cicero says. The search for truth and its investigation are, above all, peculiar to man. Therefore, whenever we are free from necessary business and other concerns, we are eager to see or to hear or to learn, considering that the discovery of obscure and wonderful things is necessary for a blessed life. I love that that the discovery of obscure and wonderful things is necessary for the blessed life. Did you know that the word scholae, from which we get the word means leash, having nothing to do? School is not supposed to be about work, but about what you do when you don't have to work. And you know what you do when you don't have to work? You delight in the discovery of obscure and wonderful things. Thank you, Cicero. When our approach to education is non-liberal, we keep our students' attention riveted to the job market, to the acquisition of skills, to earning potentials. It is not that these things aren't important. Like food, they are very important. But as with food, our appetite exceeds our needs. 
The fact that food matters a lot doesn't mean that you should eat as much as possible or that we should not restrain our appetite. We must restrain our appetite or we will kill ourselves. Something like this is happening at the societal level. Since we split the atom, it's been widely understood that our advanced brains, mounted as they are on the psychology of that skittish and insecure ancestral ape, might quite possibly lead to our self-inflicted destruction. Although we can't change society in one fell swoop, the university's mission must include looking beyond the materialist ethos of our time and educating ourselves to be free rather than enslaved to our desire for power, wealth, and security. This is the category of issue to which a liberal education addresses itself. It is an invitation to grapple with the big questions of human existence. And this is important because the big questions come from the territory of being free. The most important thing, said the Zen master Shunryu Suzuki, is to find out what is the most important thing. Freedom, you know, is great, but it brings its own problems. We are unique in the world in that we don't just follow physical laws or even our instinct. We can inhabit the world and interact with it in a way that is free, in a way that is indeterminate and indeterminable, governed by laws of our own making. Rocks, tables, clouds, etc., are not in the world in the same way that we are. We are in the world in the same way that they are, but we are also in the world in another way that is peculiar to us. We are aware of ourselves. Even beyond that, we are aware of ourselves being aware. It is this doubling of awareness upon itself that makes us such a different sort of thing than rocks and tables and clouds, and that as far as we can tell makes us different from other animals. We are ourselves by virtue of our own awareness of being ourselves. We are what we are aware of being. This self-referential and self-constituting ontological condition means that we are not determinate things like rocks or horses. We do not have a determinate soul. We have an indeterminate, self-actualizing soul. We have the quality of freedom. It is this quality that the liberal arts aim at and are engaged with. So this is why the question, who am I, is not a disinterested investigation of a pre-existing reality. To answer that question, who am I, is to constitute the answer. There is no pre-established answer to the question, who am I? Answering the question makes you what you are. This is what makes us subject to liberal arts. I hope I'm not losing too many of you, so let me call on multimedia to help illustrate the condition of freedom and indeterminacy that I am describing. Here's a video of a double pendulum where one pendulum swings from another. I think this will start playing, start playing on its own, great. So this is a simple mechanism of a pendulum swinging. Now this gentleman here is gonna cut this tie and release a second pendulum. But it's gonna tie that other joint there. Um, and you can see it behaves just like a regular pendulum. The movements of the pendulum are predictable, calculable. You know, you can figure out how long it's gonna go on for, how far it's going to swing. But when you add a second pendulum, subject to the exact same forces, simple mechanical, physical forces. See if you can detect a pattern and can predict. You can't detect the pattern because there isn't. The two pendulum scenario is a chaotic system. The system's movements, though strictly determined by simple laws of physics, are in fact unpredictable and unascertainable. It is impossible for us to determine from the initial conditions how the double pendulum is going to move. 
The double pendulum, pendulum, in other words, undergoes chaotic motion. But complex systems can be even more indeterminate. The double pendulum is what's called a first order chaotic system. There is also what's called a second order chaotic system. This is when, this is when the system reacts to predictions about it so that understanding is part of the system that functions predictably immediately changes the system itself. The stock market is like this. If we could predict what the stock market was going to do, the stock market would adapt to that knowledge and invalidate the prediction. But if we knew what the stock market was gonna to do tomorrow, we'd all go and buy the stocks that are going to, to rise and drop the ones that are going to fall, but then that market activity would invalidate the prediction. That is a second order chaotic system that incorporates into itself um, knowledge of its predictability. Because liberal education concerns itself with this existential condition of freedom, all of its questions ultimately resolve to one basic, que basic question. What kind of life should I live? What kind of life is most worth living? Let me wrap up. I fear that I have taxed your attentiveness far too long. Let me end with this. Sometimes people say that what characterizes liberal education is exactly its uselessness. That the point of liberal education is that it is not pursued as a means to obtain something else, but that it is simply sought for its own sake. I see the point, but I don't think that this is the best way to look at it. A liberal education is extremely useful, and we pursue it for the highest of human ends. To put it simply, a liberal arts education is there to help you find your way. And this is the basic, your basic task in life, to find your way. There is, in the final analysis, nothing else to do in your life but to find your way. Not someone else's way not the way of your role models or of your parents, not the way of success, but your way. A liberal education does not tell you what your way is, but it equips you for a kind of self-exploration and investigation of the world around you that can lead living to a life of honesty and clarity. That life might include making a lot of money, but it might not. The point of liberal education is not to make you rich. That life might include having an impact on many lives around you, but it might not. The point of liberal education is not to make you a benefactor of humanity. That life might include many friends, but it might not. The point isn't to turn you into a social butterfly. But a liberally educated life will be a richer life than otherwise. It will be more true. It will be more awake. It will be more alive and creative, creative, and it will be more free. To modify a quote from Henry David Thoreau, a liberal if a liberal education does one thing, it is to ensure that when you come to die, you don't then discover that you have not lived. All right, thank you very much for that powerful articulation of a liberal education and its value. I think at this point we'll turn to audience questions and I'll get some exercise running around um, delivering the, the microphone to anyone who wants to ask a question. Yeah. I was uh, delighted with your presentation, thank first you. of all. <laughs> I'm, I looked at my watch and couldn't believe how much time had already gone by. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's good. It's a great lecture. Um, I'm glad to see also that you mentioned two of my favorite guys, uh, Emerson and Thoreau, <laughs> who were great believers. You in can see they're my favorite, some of my favorite guys, too. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, and you, the quote that you uh, started with from Emerson um, talked about intuition. Yeah. And Emerson, uh, as you know, is a great believer in intuition. Uh, he once said that there's someone inside of you who knows more than you do. Uh, and that you have to listen uh, to that someone. So I was wondering, uh, in 
the role of uh, liberal education. In the world of liberal education, where does intuition fit in? What mm -hmm. we already know, mm -hmm. what we don't have to learn, that's tuition. Mm -hmm. um, students mm -hmm. think tuition's a big bill they get every semester, and it is, uh, but it's for what they're getting, they're mm -hmm. learning tuition. Yes, they're paying for it's tuition. It's paying for it, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is, I, I think, a really important question, and it's a, it points to precisely the ground that the liberal arts inhabit. The most fundamental questions that we have to live with are questions that cannot be resolved by the accumulation of data. And we live immersed in those questions. There are, of course, a lot of questions that you can answer with data. But questions like, what is my responsibility to my neighbor? What is the cost-benefit analysis between policies that will curve climate change versus continuing what we're doing, weighed against our degree of certainty and our predictions? How do you calculate all that? What is the nature of political power? What is a just distribution of our, of our, of our society's wealth? Um, what is justice? These are questions that cannot be resolved by the accumulation of data in order to navigate, but they're in front of us and we have to act all the time in ways that presuppose or aim at an answer. In order to move from this insufficiency of data to action, we need to call on faculties in us that exceed our calculation. We have to get into that territory of what Emerson might call intuition or what someone else might call judgment. It is a leap from the known to the unknown. It is a leap from the what is established by information to something that is not established by information. And that requires a certain openness. So how do, I love the quote that you, that you gave. How do you listen to a part of you that knows an answer that you don't know? How what is it for there to be a part of you that knows something that you don't know? What kind of part of you is that and how do you listen to it? I am, um, just this last week I was teaching a text in my American, one of my American studies courses. It was the, the, uh, a little essay, about 20 pages, called Personal Narrative by Jonathan Edwards, the, the great 18th century Puritan. Um, and Jonathan, this personal narrative is essentially the story of his growth in Christianity and uh, the moments in his development in which he experienced a powerful kind of completely transformative sense of God's presence or of God's redemption or of God's glory. Um, and one of the things that you see in that narrative is that so many of these points in which that happens is out walking in the woods, out alone. And it's like there are some things that you can do that put you in a receptive position. There are some things you can do that open you to possibilities within yourself that would be occluded, that would be hidden, that would be papered over by distractions, Etc. Liberal education conditions you to put to, to be in that place. In lib when you walk into a classroom in a liberal education classroom to talk about Nietzsche or to talk about Shakespeare, talk about Dante. You know, as a teacher, you have some things that you want to communicate and some some perhaps some skills that you want to emphasize, perhaps some historical context. But you don't know what's going to happen in that classroom. You have a discussion, and then sometimes lightning strikes in that discussion. Um, a kind of revelation happens, a kind of magic happens in that moment. You've placed yourself in the position where you are a candidate for that experience. So I think liberal education equips us, habituates us to put ourselves at the edge of what we know and see what happens. It is not a comfortable position. It is often a very uncomfortable position. Liberal education is training in that capacity for freedom. That's where freedom lies. Freedom is not is what is not determined, right? Freedom is what exceeds calculation. So I would say that liberal, and this is why liberal education always can always be described in spiritual terms. Because it does aim at a kind of depth and profundity of the existential condition of humanity that is the same kind of stuff that spiritual inquiry goes into. And, and, and liberal education is a way without 
bringing explicitly religion or God or beliefs or doctrines is a way of orienting the human being to this higher truths and these higher abstractions and realities that ultimately ground, orient, frame our lives. Um, other questions? We especially encourage ones from students, but here we have one from Maury. A lifelong um, student. Yeah. I was once one of those. <laughs> Recognizing the decline of liberal education in institutions across this country, what do you think is the role of the university in attempting to uh, uh, avert that decline and what function should it have in, or uh, speech should it face, particularly to parents who are saying, I want my uh, child to have the benefit of an education for the purpose of self-improvement. And so what's the role of the university? Thank you. This is a question that I think about a lot because the university is the institution in our society that has been framed for this purpose. The university in some ways carries the arc of our humanity. The university harbors in its, bo in its bosom, harbors in its heart, this mission that is non-utilitarian, non-practical, non-applied, right? And that's the origin of the university. For hundreds and hundreds of years, you had people close to universities doing research, doing investigation, writing treatises, understanding things just for its own value. And then something happens in the 19th century where the university reorients itself towards what we today call a research university where the object of the university becomes no longer the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake of human cultivation. The object of the university becomes the investigation of nature, the reproduction of that knowledge, the dissemination of that knowledge, the advancing of that knowledge, right? So the, the university becomes oriented towards creating, generating, acquiring new knowledge. So science, technology, health science, becomes the center of gravity of the epistemological, the knowledge mission of the university, to the detriment and neglect of the other mission of the university, which has to do with cultivating human beings to think about questions that cannot be resolved through investigation. But we don't know any better today the fundamental questions that ground our human existence, like the ones I was mentioning before about justice, about love, about responsibility, about political power. We don't know better today what justice is than Plato did 2,500 years ago. Those subjects just are not conducive. They're not susceptible to empirical resolution and investigation, but the university is organized that way. So there are competing missions within the university. The mission of, of generating, producing, improving new knowledge, and the mission of cultivating individuals. What has happened in the contemporary university since the 19th century is that that second mission or was it the first mission? The, 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 the research mission, the mission of generating and accumulating knowledge has become so dominant as to neglect the cultivating mission. Now that cultivating mission exists primarily at the undergraduate level. When you get to graduate school, it's about professionalization. It's whether you wanna be a lawyer or a doctor or a literary critic, a scholar, it's about specialization, but at the undergraduate level, that's where liberal education has to happen. The university, as a whole, there are, there are exceptions. And of course, the, the, the one big exception, one big qualified exception, one is, is Catholic universities. Catholic, Catholic universities and liberal arts colleges, both of those harken back to this tradition of cultivating the individual. But that is increasingly under threat, increasingly diluted, increasingly lost to the detriment of our students and to the detriment of our society. What we're living through right now, the political crisis in, through which we're living, the crisis in democracy, the breakdown of our democracy that we are experiencing with outcomes that are unpredictable and the scary outcomes are very, very scary. Hopefully we can put ourselves back from the brink, but we are on a, on a downward slide to a very, very ugly place as a society. We have lost the capacity to resolve and dialogue and discourse through our differences. We have lost the, we have lost 
social institutions that have credibility and reliability across the political spectrum. You know, the, 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 the different factions in the political spectrum now have their own sources of news and their own sources of authority. And institutions like the media, the university, the government, the courts are no longer, no longer command the confidence of, the, of, of large segments of the population. It's a bad, bad situation. And part of what has fed that situation is the failure of universities to teach, to teach liberal education. That decline in, in, in the liberal mission of the university that begins in the 19th century, and which today is so dominant in our sector, bears some of the responsibility for this discursive collapse and democratic collapse that we're in the middle of. So what is the role of the university and the responsibility of the university? A huge one, but it's one that the univer universities are not meeting. Hi, I'm back here. Uh, so I was wondering if it's really an invitation to expand on what you said. I really liked what you said, but I felt like you mostly emphasized the practical aim of the uh, liberal education in the sense of helping us lead better lives or lead well, or what kind of life should I live? Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not a scientist and a philosopher speaking, but I, I wonder if you're, you haven't said enough, or I'd like to hear you say more about the theoretical aspect of a liberal education. So you quoted a lot from Aristotle from his politics about living well and the political and moral questions that are raised in a liberal education. But he also says in the metaphysics that philosophy, which for him really is uh, the liberal arts, it's all mm -hmm. human knowledge, begins in questions about like why, uh, what's happening when the moon disappears? And this is the birthplace of mm -hmm. astronomical science. Mm -hmm. And in your own talk, you told the story about the history of human beings and emphasized ideas about what it is to be human. You know, what is it to have the kind of freedom that we have? What is it to have the kind of self-consciousness that we have? So I wonder if you could expand on the role that a liberal education isn't just about how one should live one life, but there's also theoretical questions about what it is to be a human being. What is it to be capable of self-reflection? What is it to have the kind of freedom that we have? What is it, uh, what's our origin, our place in our universe? And these are questions that are both answered in the sciences and which would make the sciences part of the liberal education, but also in the theoretical humanities, like in, in philosophy where we ask these sorts of questions that aren't just practical questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a you, you point to something very important. Let me rec recommend a book. Um, it's a professor, a philosophy professor at St. John's College who wrote a book called Lost in Thought. Um, the subtitle is like something like on the pleasures of learning, but the, the main title is Lost in Thought. And in it, she makes the argument that um, the life of disinterested contemplation, which is a kind of asceticism, that is there is a kind of self-denial of frivolity and self-indulgence that is required for the life of serious contemplation. And she says, this is the highest aspiration, the highest fulfillment of, of, of our humanity. It's an Aristotelian argument. Aristotle agrees with that. You, you, you pointed to my, to my use of Aristotle. But Aristotle argues that the good life, the best life, is going to involve very serious contemplation for its own sake. That is that you are going, that, that the highest fulfillment, the highest delight, the highest satisfaction of a well-lived human life is this activity of contemplation. This is activity of trying to understand things that have absolutely no practical, practical application to your life. You know, why does the moon disappear? What happens at the subatomic level? What is the age of the universe? What happens? to make the Big Bang happen? Are there hidden dimensions that we don't understand? Just things that have absolutely no practical application. Aristotle sees as constituting the highest expression of our humanity. I agree with that. And, I, and, and, and it is true that I, it, it is not the an aspect of liberal education that I emphasize. I emphasize the aspect about living a full, a full life. But when you do get down to what is it, what is a full life? My accounting of that is, uh, is very Aristotelian in, in, in that it includes a very 
hefty dose of leisure activity that is contemplative activity that has no practical no practical value that is just good in itself and look we 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 do a bunch of that you know we, we go to museums and we look look at pictures we look at paintings sculptures just just look at them just spend an afternoon in a museum looking at these things taking it in there's no value in fact you 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 pay money to get into the museum or give a donation or something. You spend the afternoon there, you're on your feet all afternoon, maybe you're tired. You, you, it takes something out of you, but somehow it does something for you. Somehow it does something to your sense of your own humanity. Somehow it expands you, somehow it fulfills you in this non-utilitarian way. Um, and contemplation and learning is, 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 is all like that. So uh, thank you for, for highlighting that aspect that a liberal education is education in this, in this sort of activity that doesn't have a practical value, but that somehow expresses and satisfies the deepest aspects of your humanity, this, the deepest aspect of that freedom. You know, it's one of the things that sets us apart from, from, other, from other animals. This, this, this thing that we make, we make the statue, we make the painting, we made that lion, that lion woman or lion man. So um, even though the clock behind us says 648 and suggests that time has stood still for the past hour and a half, I think out of the interest of time, we have to say thank you very much to Professor Montas for his wonderful lecture. Thank you. And thank you all uh, for coming. So I think this brings an end to our wonderful evening and engaging conversation. Thank, thank you, you again.